for 10, 15 minutes late. And um, they were doing such a great job. I almost turned around and went home. There you go. Good morning. There he is. Hi, welcome. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jim, great. how are you? Good. Good morning, everybody. Great. I guess we're ready, ready to start. Good. So uh, we've been talking about uh, ethics and choices in economics. Uh, ethics uh, meaning uh, making choices for the good, for well-being. And we've been exploring the challenges of those choices uh, regarding individual decisions, uh, relations with other people, uh, and now uh, individuals as citizens, uh, meaning uh, our choices regarding politics, our choices regarding candidates that we vote for, policies that we subscribe to, with the focus, of course, on the economic sphere. And today I want to talk about the theories of politics and government and the kinds of choices uh, that we face, what government uh, is supposed to do. Of course, that's a quite contested uh, set of ideas. We've been debating that question about the role of government for at least 2,300 years in Western philosophy since Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle began debating that. And uh, a lot of uh, interesting ideas have been raised during uh, those 2,300 years, and we confront uh, those issues today. So I'll speak about uh, the nature of government, the kinds of uh, responsibilities uh, that government has in the economy, uh, and the choices that we face especially the ethical choices as citizens uh, in uh, advocating actions by government. And I will uh, share my screen and uh, I hope you see some familiar faces, but uh, we'll come back to them in uh, just a moment. So today's subject is the ethics of government. How should government officials act in carrying out their responsibilities? and the ethics of citizens. Uh, what should our uh, desires be about government uh, role in society? Uh, how should we decide on how to vote for politicians and how to make decisions on public policy issues, for instance, when we're voting in a referendum? And I like to start at the start of the Western uh, theories of government. There are, of course, similar wisdom traditions in other parts of the world. But in Western civilization, I think it's probably right to say that Plato's Republic may be the first the detailed treatment of government. And uh, in the Republic, Plato, through the uh, voice of Socrates, uh, is a uh, asking the question about the nature of justice, both the justice in individuals uh, and uh, then by analogy, uh, or actually by most of the analysis in the Republic, justice in uh, the state. And the state at the time of Plato is the city state, the polis, uh, from which of course we get our word politics. So the question uh, addressed by Plato in the Republic is how to design a city-state, a polis, to be just and why to be just uh, in order to promote eudaimonia, happiness or thriving of the citizens of the uh, polis. So this is extremely important. Uh, this is a question of design for Plato. Uh, the Republic is uh, actually a conversation of Socrates and his counterparts 
about how to design the ideal city state. It's fascinating uh, because it's a very constructive uh, idea. If we are choosing the best kind of city state, what would it be? How would we choose its operating principles? Uh, and therefore it's very much a design question. Uh, the idea is that a just society is one that is harmonious where the different parts fit together properly and thereby are conducive to the well-being of the members of the society. And the Republic takes up many, many issues uh, in politics, but of course also in epistemology, in moral ethics and uh, psychology and other topics. But among the political economy questions, that is the way that politics relates to the economy, the topics include the design of the laws of the state, the division of labor in the society, the nature of property rights and property holdings, and the kinds of education that the state should provide. So the model in the Republic is <coughs> of a kind of public education, and it's designed to promote the uh, skills of the different parts of the society in relation to the roles of those different parts of the society. So the warriors get one kind of training, the uh, philosophical guardians get another kind of training, the artisans get another kind of training. And so the idea is to design an education system that is appropriate for the division of labor in the society. Plato's student, uh, Aristotle, a quite good student uh, who did well in his courses and then uh, went on to question many of uh, his teacher's assumptions, which is a, a good thing for students to do, uh, of course, wrote the second great treatise on politics. Uh, in a way, uh, he invented systematic political science by investigating a comparison of types of government and the dynamics of uh, those different uh, government types in the politics. It is a most amazing book. Uh, like many of uh, Aristotle's books, uh, which are collections of his lectures, uh, they created what we would regard as the field of study uh, of that topic. Uh, that's true of the Nicomachean ethics, uh, creating the study of systematic study of uh, ethics. It's true of the politics. Uh, it's uh, true of uh, countless other areas of Aristotle's writing. So the politics is really the first systematic text of political science in Western thought. And Aristotle asked the question, what should be the constitution of the state? That is the basic rules of design of the state, the laws, uh, the principles of decision-making and the distribution of income and wealth. Like Socrates, uh, his intellectual grandfather and uh, Plato, his uh, own teacher, uh, Aristotle assumed that the purpose of uh, his questioning and the purpose of a state's constitution, its rules of action, the distribution of income and so forth, is to produce eudaimonia, is to produce thriving of the citizens. And Aristotle famously was interested in the question of whether this government should be ruled by one a monarch, for example, ruled by a few, uh, an aristocracy, or ruled by the many, uh, a polity or a republic. And Aristotle famously distinguished the good forms and the deviant forms of rule by one, rule by a few, or rule by many. So the uh, favorable 
versions of those three categories are monarchy, aristocracy, and polity. And the deviant or the bad forms of rule by one, few, or many is tyranny, uh, the rule by a tyrant, uh, oligarchy, the rule by a few, typically the wealthy, uh, and for their own purposes, and uh, the rule by many. And the Greek word for that often is democracy, which we inherently tend to praise. But uh, in Aristotle's worry and traditional Greek uh, and Roman worry, the rule by the many was mob rule rather than what we would like to think of as democratic rule. So the deviant form of rule by the many is rule by an unthinking mob, something like January 6th uh, at the US Capitol rather than what we think of as democracy. So these are the starting points for Western thought on politics, but they're the starting points for us as well, because they ask the most important questions of political economy. Uh, that is, what should we design government to be and to do in order to promote our well-being? And I think it's a, a a wonderful perspective. It's not saying government just is here, let's study what it does, or it is not saying government is God-given uh, and uh, government is ruling by uh, a, a supreme decree. It is saying government is here at the service of the well-being of the people in uh, the society, in the case of uh, the ancient Greeks in the polity or the Greek city-state, that unique, remarkable uh, set of uh, political institutions that lasted for uh, about uh, 250 or 300 years uh, in the uh, 4th century and 3rd century BC before being replaced by empires of the region, Alexander's empires and the Hellenistic empires that followed. So those questions are important questions for us. So Plato and Aristotle get us started. Uh, I add Emperor Constantine because of course, the uh, Greek city-states uh, were eventually conquered by the Roman Empire uh, in 146 BC uh, and uh, Roman rule was very different from uh, the Greek city-state rule. Uh, but one of the uh, most formative uh, parts of Western history, of course, was the, uh, th the fact that Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire uh, and uh, the West uh, Western Europe and then uh, Western colonies became Christian rule. And Constantine, of course, in uh, 313 AD, uh, famously had uh, a vision of uh, the cross as his guide to victory uh, in his uh, war for uh, the empire. Uh, and after his victory, uh, ended the persecution of the Christians and uh, allowed for the rule of the Christians. Uh, this was not the full incorporation of Christianity into the Roman Empire, which occurred uh, about uh, 70 years later in 380 AD, when Emperor Theodosius I uh, issued uh, his own edict of uh, Thessaloniki, which uh, put the Greek put Christianity of the Nicene Creed uh, as the official religion of the Roman Empire. But for us, what is uh, fundamental in Western history is that politics and Christianity, meaning politics and Christian ethics, uh, became uh, it, in this way. Uh, 
fundamentally intertwined uh, through the incorporation of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. And ever since, uh, the political questions that Aristotle and Plato asked are also in Western thought intermixed with Christian philosophy, Christian theology, uh, and uh, the uh, kinds of philosophical ideas uh, of Greek thought, which in turn were incorporated into Roman thought. So we have a confluence, as is often put, of Rome and Jerusalem uh, in Western thinking about government that comes down to us uh, from uh, at least uh, the third century or fourth century AD. Uh, and that's uh, very fundamental for us in understanding the way we think about government and the way we think about politics. I'm going to jump ahead uh, one millennium from Constantine, not that there isn't a lot of history between uh, Constantine and Theodosius uh, on the one hand and uh, the European Renaissance, but I'm going to jump forward a thousand years to uh, a next uh, pivotal set of thinkers about government uh, that are very important for us to understand our current debate about government. Of course, uh, Machiavelli uh, is known to us from his writing, The Prince, though he wrote uh, many great works of political science. Machiavelli was uh, a uh, senior official in Florence uh, who uh, lost his job uh, upon a change of uh, government in the uh, late uh, 1490s. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, when government changed and brought the Medicis uh, back to power uh, in the early 1500s, uh, Machiavelli wrote the prince, his famous treatise on governance by the prince. Uh, it's surmised as a kind of uh, 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 seeking of, uh, of employment uh, in, in the new uh, Florentine government uh, as a kind of uh, job proposal. So Machiavelli's The Prince put politics uh, in a very different, uh, fundamentally different direction. The interpretation of Machiavelli, I have to uh, add, is heatedly contested among scholars, but I'll talk about the uh, the basic interpretation of Machiavelli uh, briefly, uh, and that is that he viewed politics as a game of power. Uh, rather than asking the question, what will deliver the thriving of the citizens, which is the question that Plato and Aristotle gave us, Machiavelli asked the question, how should the prince stay in power? And his uh, guidebook to that, uh, The Prince, uh, is Machiavellian, uh, the adjective that we use to describe uh, rule uh, that is uh, devious, uh, that is cynical, uh, that is guided by one consideration, the interest of the ruler, and not guided uh, by the more fundamental question of the well-being of the ruled. So we think about a Machiavellian politician who is one who connives to keep power. And while that's not the only interpretation of Machiavelli's writing, I think it's useful to say that uh, since Machiavelli, we have in political science and in philosophy as well, a strand of politics, a strand of thinking, which is not about eudaimonia. It is not about thriving. It is not about design principles. It is about the competition for power. And many political scientists would say, don't 
be idealistic about government. Government is about the struggle for power. And that is reflecting <laughs> Machiavelli's way of thinking and his advice to uh, the, uh, the prince. I emphasize Machiavelli because we're taking a different route. Uh, in uh, this discussion, I'm interested in the question that Plato and Aristotle and those who followed asked, which is how should government act not for the sake of the prince, but for the sake of the people in the society? I personally have very little interest almost all the time in whether a particular politician is elected or not elected, uh, other than by a dint of the question of what that election means for the well being of the public. Uh, and don't like to see politics as a game of power, but rather as an instrument of promoting well being. Well, the uh, English tradition of political science, which became the American tradition of political science, which because of the British and American influence on the world, became a powerful worldwide influence on thinking about politics, starts with Thomas Hobbes uh, in uh, writing in the 1640s. Uh, and uh, of course, his most famous treatise is the Leviathan. And I expect that many of you have read the Leviathan. The Leviathan is the uh, giant monster, which uh, signifies the powerful state. And Hobbes is writing uh, to defend state power. Uh, and he's uh, writing to defend absolute state power, but doing it on a philosophical basis. How philosophically can you reach the idea of an overpowering state? Well, Hobbes does it by a rather uh, direct and relentless assault on Aristotle who he regards uh, as uh, a horrible guide to philosophy and to human nature. Aristotle has, on the whole, a very positive uh, view of human potential. Uh, not an unalloyed uh, idealism, but uh, a, an optimistic realism, uh, because Aristotle believes that uh, human beings are capable of reason, that uh, virtue is the promotion of reason, and that human beings are by nature social animals, zoon politikon uh, in uh, ancient Greek, meaning that they inherently live together and know how to live together. Hobbes has none of it. Uh, Hobbes has a very... Uh, dark view of human nature and uh, a very individualist view of human nature. So for Hobbes, individuals are not rational beings using their practical wisdom, their phronesis to promote their own good and using the virtue of justice to promote the good of others, much less the uh, the uh, uh, theological virtue of mercy uh, for others. For Hobbes, uh, humanity is a fallen uh, species uh, in that individuals have insatiable desires. They fear death. They try to overcome those fears by accumulating power by accumulating fame, by accumulating goods. And that drive, according to Hobbes, is insatiable. And because it is insatiable, human beings inevitably collide with other human beings. Remember all that sweet talk about altruism last week? Hobbes would have none of it. He would say people will take what they can get. 
all that talk about cooperation with the prisoner's dilemma, none of it, all that talk about public goods and contributing to the common good, all those games of trust, Hobbes has none of it. People are ambitious, uh, relentless, uh, insatiable, colliding against each other. And his theory of government is that government is basically present to stop people from killing each other. And so Hobbes invents the idea of a social contract wherein individuals <laughs> living in this harsh pre-civil uh, natural state agree, let's stop killing each other by putting a Leviathan over us. And we put down our arms because we give the weapons, the force to one monopolist, uh, one holder of the force, the Leviathan, our absolute government. And that way we can't kill each other. And that way we can live our lives of insatiable wants uh, and uh, desires and so forth. We will collide with each other, but we won't kill each other. And of course, uh, the most famous statement of uh, this is Hobbes' description of the state of nature. The state of nature is one in which there are no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, <coughs> continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Wow. What an optimist. So whereas Aristotle said people are sociable, they make friends, uh, they form families, they form communities. Hobbes says they kill each other unless someone stops them from doing so. And that someone is government, is the Leviathan. And why did he write in these terms? Well, of course, always from, uh, we should view this from a philosophical perspective. Uh, from a personality uh, perspective and from a historical perspective, because Hobbes was writing at the time of the great English civil war. And civil war is disaster. Uh, in civil war, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so Hobbes was saying, end the civil war by having one authority of power. John Locke of course, is the British philosopher who, in a way, uh, partly humanizes Hobbes uh, by viewing human nature in a much more benign manner, uh, and uh, at least part of the way towards uh, uh, Aristotle. Uh, because for Locke, there is a natural order not of violence, but of individual freedom. But there are still reasons for government, says Locke. Uh, government is needed, especially not to stop people from killing each other, as Hobbes thought, but to stop people from stealing from each other, to protect property. Because property, according to Locke, is the ability of human beings to use uh, God's munificence. Uh, God creates the world for all, but Locke says that individuals cannot use God's creation unless they combine their individual efforts with uh, nature. Uh, that is, unless they plow the soils, unless uh, they till the land, unless they cultivate the crops. Uh, so God gives creation to all, but humans put it to use through private property, especially through land and farming. And for Locke, therefore, people come together, not uh, because life is uh, short and brutish, but rather to enhance the natural order with a civil order in which private property is protected. Individuals can accumulate wealth and well-being and so Locke is a optimistic version of Hobbes. Again, uh, it's a social contract. It's an individualist 
philosophy, uh, unlike Aristotle, who says the community pre-exists because individuals could not even survive without community. But for Locke and Hobbes, the community is created. Civil society follows uh, the state of nature. But for Locke, this is already a time of improvement. This is a time of uh, enclosing land to make it more productive. And Locke uh, worked with his patron, uh, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, to uh, engage in uh, colonial investments in the Americas. Locke actually wrote early uh, uh, constitutions for the Carolinas. And so Locke was very interested in improvement of the land. And the purpose of government is therefore improvement. It's property, rights, and improvement. So Hobbes thought, give government to the Leviathan so we don't kill each other. Locke says, establish government for the purpose of protecting property. They each are calling for a, a certain kind of government, and Locke is famous to us today in uh, calling for limited government, but it's interesting to see what kind of limited government. He advocated government by consent, uh, and in a way Hobbes did too, although it's consent initially in the state of nature, not ongoing consent. But Locke's consent is that government is established for one overriding purpose, and that's to protect private property. So a government of consent, says Locke, is not empowered to take property, to redistribute property, for example. Uh, a government, according to Locke, is there for one and really only one purpose, and that is to protect private property. So Locke, in a way, is a radical because he calls for government by consent, but he's also a reactionary in that the government's role is to protect property rights. And in my view, it's not an accident. He worked with the upper class, with the elites, with the landed gentry, and he was defending their interests. And so from an economic point of view, I regard him as mainly a reactionary rather than a progressive because his claim is that the redistribution of property, even to meet human needs, is uh, beyond the legitimate role of government because government is created not for general well-being, not for equality, not for redistribution, <coughs> not for a standard of eudaimonia. Government is created to protect property rights. Well, again, the British continue to be extremely influential, partly because of the ideas, but I think even more importantly, because Britain became the first industrialized nation. And by dint of that, it became so powerful that it conquered a large part of the world. And by dint of that, British ideas became global ideas. So a lot of these philosophers would not be remembered, actually, were it not for the history of the British Empire. Uh, there are no doubt wonderful philosophers of many, many uh, regions that we don't remember because they were on the losing side of history, not because their philosophy was any worse. But in terms of politics, the next uh, three that I would mention that are relevant for us are Adam Smith with The Wealth of Nations, uh, Jeremy Bentham, and Karl Marx. Karl Marx, of course, being a German relocated to the British Museum and to London, where he engaged in his intellectual and activist activities. Adam Smith, we recall as the uh, inventor of modern economics with the doctrines of the division of labor, uh, of trade as a way to 
extend the division of labor and thereby to raise productivity and the goal of wealth as the key to well being in society. And many ingenious ideas. And of course, making famous the phrase, the invisible hand, as we've discussed. But it's also notable and very important. And it's really the reason why Adam Smith is on uh, this lecture. In book five of The Wealth of Nations, Smith talks about the things government absolutely should do. So most of The Wealth of Nations is remembered as calling for government to let markets operate. Uh, the Wealth of Nations is remembered as a laissez-faire text that markets through the invisible hand will create wealth. But Smith also notes in book five of The Wealth of Nations that governments are needed in areas where markets will not function, in providing public goods. So Smith starts a serious scientific investigation of a core question that would follow for the next uh, 200 years. What in a market system should government do? So starting from the presumption that much of economic activity or even most of economic activity will be mediated through private property and exchange what role of government should there be in that question? Jeremy Bentham uh, was an extremely influential philosopher and activist and political advisor uh, to Latin American countries and uh, of course trying to influence the British empire as well. And Bentham's idea was a version of Aristotelian eudaimonianism. So if Aristotle asked the question, what will uh, produce thriving in society, Bentham gives it a very specific uh, idea and name. And of course, the name is utilitarianism. And the idea is that thriving or eudaimonia which in English uh, of the age of Smith and Bentham is called utility, is that society and politics should be organized to maximize utility. And thus comes utilitarianism. And the doctrine of uh, utility is the famous expressions uh, by Bentham, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. So the ethics of utilitarianism is to promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And Bentham was writing literally for the legislators, for the lawmakers. He says it is the obligation to minister to general happiness. That's very Aristotelian or platonic. The obligation to minister to general happiness was an obligation paramount to and inclusive of every other. So it's the highest aim of government is ministering to general happiness. Bentham had very particular ideas about happiness that were less sophisticated than Aristotle's because the Bentham psychology or psychological assumptions, I mean by that, were uh, rather straightforwardly hedonistic, that happiness means pleasure, uh, and uh, the opposite is pain, and the goal of <clears throat> promoting uh, the greatest good for the greatest number is to promote the excess of pleasure over pain. <clears throat> so a starkly hedonistic philosophy. And then Bentham wrote uh, extensively on what would lead to more pleasure and less pain, less suffering. Uh, and that became the guide for moral legislation. 
Karl Marx uh, shows up here because he had a very particular view about government, uh, a uh, rather cynical one uh, and, and a rather dark one, I would say, uh, but of course with uh, an eschatological or uh, salvationist uh, perspective as well. Marx, uh, in, in his way, uh, harked back to Machiavelli, thinking that government was not organized for the good of uh, the society, but rather, uh, unlike Machiavelli, who focused on the prince, Karl Marx focused on the uh, capitalist class as being the uh, purpose of uh, government of his time. So Marx argued that government was merely the uh, uh, superstructure of power, uh, power of the ruling class. And that to think about government as delivering the greatest good for the greatest number was naive, thought Marx, uh, because the governments around him, he felt, were governments of the capitalist class of the bourgeoisie, and that only a revolution would change that. And so Marx, of course, in the Communist Manifesto with Engels, calls for a proletarian revolution to capture government uh, and uh, make it an instrument of uh, power of the proletariat. And eventually the state will wither away because in Marx's conception of a communistic society of social ownership, there won't be the need for the state because the state in Marx's view is there mainly as a force of exploitation, not as a force of good. Marx should be contrasted with his fellow socialist, Edward Bernstein, who for me is a, a great hero because Edward Bernstein, who uh, is a generation uh, older than, uh, younger than uh, Marx, argued that Marx was too pessimistic about government. Uh, Bernstein said, these democracies taking shape around us in the second half of the 19th century can actually deliver some good. Uh, they can actually uh, lead to progressive reforms. We should not give up said Bernstein on the idea that democracy, that is inclusive governance, especially with the universal suffrage, could produce economic and social reform so that government would not be an agent of only the prince, as in Machiavelli, or of the ruling class, as in Marx, but could be an agent of society, especially the ever expanding industrial class of workers. So Bernstein uh, as a uh, German uh, thinker and trade unionist expected that expanded suffrage and representation and an expanding industrial economy would lead incrementally to more representative and more just government and to higher well-being in society. His doctrine was the doctrine of social democracy, democracy in the service of social goals. Max Weber, shown here, is uh, another great German thinker, uh, the uh, greatest German sociologist of the beginning of the 20th century, who wrote uh, brilliantly about the state. And I wanted to bring him in because he has a formal definition of politics. Uh, for Aristotle, politics is uh, governance for well-being. For Machiavelli, it's governance for the prince. For Hobbes, it is to stop civil war. For Locke, it is to protect private property. And Weber asked the question, what can, we, what can we synthesize from all of this about the real nature of the state? And his famous 
definition is that the state is, quote, the human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So this is a formal or sociological definition of the state. Uh, what is it uh, that we talk about when we talk about politics? It is the locus of legitimate power or the ability to deploy force with legitimacy that defines the state compared to the mafia, the underworld, civil society. It's the ability to mobilize force. Of course, that force doesn't mean and isn't meant to mean the sheer deployment of violence. It is meant to back the collection of taxes or the requisition of resources, for example. And Weber adds the key term legitimate. Uh, it is not, in Weber's view, uh, the uh, capture of a territory by a warlord. Uh, it is uh, part of the human community that claims the monopoly of legitimate force within a territory. The uh, next thinker uh, on the right is the greatest political economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, who of course uh, invented Keynesian economics and Keynes added another dimension that was not really present in thinking up until Keynes. And that is that a role of the state is to stabilize a modern economy that otherwise suffers from bouts of financial and monetary instability. So Keynes added another major role of government to the kinds of roles that were familiar to Adam Smith uh, or indeed to Machiavelli or even to Aristotle, building roads, uh, building battlements, uh, fielding armies, uh, other parts of state activity, Keynes added a major category, uh, very relevant for us today because we talk about the Keynesian stimulus of Biden's new rescue package, for example. But the idea of Keynes was that government has another responsibility that in a modern economy, there are business cycles or fluctuations that need to be <laughs> stabilized. Three more, uh, and then I, I will uh, talk about uh, the implications. So uh, Keynes is uh, uh, a, a, a junior uh, critic of Keynes uh, in the 1930s uh, who became famous uh, in his own right, won a Nobel Prize in economics and taught at the University of Chicago and is uh, influential until today is Friedrich Hayek. Uh, Friedrich Hayek uh, was a, a Viennese uh, economist who came to England, taught at the London School of Economics, uh, battled with Keynes's philosophy <laughs> and became the doyen, the uh, guru, the leader of <coughs> free market ideas after World War II. But Hayek is here not because of his free market ideas, but because of his political idea that he expressed in a famous book in 1945 called The Road to Serfdom. In The Road to Serfdom, Hayek said, do not allow government to become too big because governments like Machiavelli's prince have their own interests. And if government becomes too powerful, it will take over markets, private property, and society. And so in a way, Hayek follows John Locke in saying that Government is limited in its role to defend property, but not to get larger or more ambitious than that. And certainly, said Hayek, not to undertake the grand stabilization efforts that Keynes advocated, because what Hayek added 
looking at the examples of Bolshevik Russia or the Soviet Union and uh, the Third Reich, uh, Hitler's uh, National Socialism, Hayek claimed that large government would lead to servility uh, and uh, a kind of state uh, authoritarian or totalitarian power. So Hayek said economic reforms of the kind that I, for example, believe in to give help to the poor or social insurance or to build a more <coughs> infrastructure, Hayek claimed that those might look good, but they will lead to serfdom, serfdom to the state, not to an individual aristocrat or lord of a manor, but to an overpowering government. I, I think that time has shown that Hayek was wrong about this. Uh, his book is uh, 75 years old and governments that are large in the economy and activist, like in Scandinavia, for example, are not totalitarian governments. A social democratic system like the one that Edward Bernstein called for in which the government taxes and transfers to reduce income inequalities does not lead to totalitarianism despite Hayek's belief that it does. So I view Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom as a hypothesis, not as a conclusion. And I regard it as one that was tested after World War II and proved to be wrong. So a famous book, but not a good one in my view, uh, or not a correct one. John Rawls, uh, many of you know, and I have mentioned as the author of uh, A Theory of Justice, he was a Harvard philosopher who asked uh, the question of Aristotle and Bentham, uh, what would be a good society? And he asked it in the same spirit, what would lead to the well-being of people? But he said, in order to ask that question accurately, a good way to do that is a thought experiment called the original veil. And the idea of Rawls is that we could ask the following question. What kind of society would we like to live in? What laws and rules would we like it to have if we know that we will be a member of that society but we don't know which member of that society we will be. Will we be rich? Will we be poor? Uh, we don't know. So all we know is that there is to be a polis, a city state or a country, and it is going to organize itself by laws and by government functions. And we don't know what role we're going to play in that society, but we're going to be there. What rules would we choose behind that veil of ignorance, as Rawls called it? What would we choose after which we would find out, oh, bad luck, we're part of the poor and we forgot to provide for them, so we're about to starve to death. So Rawls asked us a to engage in a thought experiment. And he came up to a conclusion, uh, which uh, is in a way a dubious conclusion, but he came up to the conclusion that because we are super risk averse, we would like to ensure that the society that we're gonna live in takes the best possible care of the worst off person in that society. So technically our rules should maximize the minimum position, maximize the person least well off. And that would be a proper conclusion if everybody is so super risk averse that all we care about is the tiny chance that we might be the worst off person in the society that we're designing. 
Uh, as many economists have pointed out, if we can assume that people are not quite so risk averse, they won't focus only on the well being of the worst person, they'll focus on a more kind of general well being in society, accepting the fact that in that distribution of well being behind the uh, veil of ignorance, it may turn out that they are on the lower end of that spectrum once they realize which particular place in society they will bear. The final uh, philosopher that I want to mention in this 2,300 year sweep of uh, philosophy about government is Robert Nozick, who was a colleague of John Rawls, uh, a senior colleague of mine. Uh, and he wrote a uh, very influential book that was uh, the uh, uh, required reading alongside Rawls's theory of justice. Uh, Nozick's book was called Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And Nozick was very Lockean in his philosophy. For Nozick said, we don't choose behind a veil of ignorance. We are individuals that have rights and want our freedom. And our freedom should count beyond anything. Uh, our liberty is our highest value. And so Nozick developed a libertarian philosophy that said, if a given situation is fair, then any voluntary actions from that given situation will also be fair, he said. Nozick gave a famous example. The basketball star of my era uh, was Walt Chamberlain uh, and of Nozick's era, uh, and uh, Will Chamberlain, excuse me. Uh, and uh, uh, Nozick said, suppose that Wilt Chamberlain is such a good player that uh, a million people voluntarily pay $1 each to see Wilt Chamberlain play during the season and Wilt Chamberlain becomes a millionaire compared to the rest of society. He said that uh, a socialist may feel that's unfair. Here's a millionaire uh, amongst a, a much poorer society. But Nozick said, Wilt Chamberlain earned his million. All exchanges were voluntary. Nobody was made worse off. And so we should have no moral qualms about Wilt Chamberlain being a millionaire in the society. What he didn't note was that maybe there's somebody starving in that society and what would be the responsibility to that starving person? So I don't find Nozick's uh, theory of uh, justice very complete because he made us look in one direction at the rather harmless arrival of a new millionaire, but he turned our attention away from many other injustices. Uh, where did today's rich people really get their money? Uh, what kind of uh, discrimination or conquest led to previous accumulations of wealth? Nozick was not interested in that question. And what happens when people are suffering? Again, Nozick was not interested in that question adequately, in my view. But he was the dean of modern libertarian thinking among modern philosophers, and his book is very influential. Why have I gone through all of these <coughs> thoughts? Just to say that the idea of politics and the state is vast and differentiated. Starting with the ancient Greeks, the idea of government was how to make a better society. When Christianity became part of the Roman Empire, the ideas of a better society were the ideas of Christian or Christian views of a better society. Uh, and uh, Christianity, Christian ethics, and politics became deeply intertwined. From the Renaissance onward, different theories of government were offered. Government for power, government to stop civil war, 
government to protect private property rights, each of them causing different implications for what government should do. Some emphasize that government should be active to promote the greatest good for the greatest number. Others said government should be limited because it is a locus of power. It's a threat, a threat to private property, a threat of dominance, uh, a, a threat even of servility or serfdom of the population. And this has led to an ongoing debate uh, among citizens and uh, among, of course, political scientists and philosophers as well. So now let me bring us to the present. Governments do a lot of things. What they do is debated. Uh, but let me mention, first of all, some of the many things that governments actually do. Governments provide so-called public goods, which I'll define shortly. Uh, defense, the military, that is, justice, the courts and the prisons, research, uh, the National Science Foundation, police and firefighting, uh, the NYPD, uh, the New York Fire Department, epidemic control, we hope, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, Governments provide social services, healthcare, Medicare and Medicaid, education, the New York public schools, for example. Governments provide infrastructure, roads, sewerage, rail, power lines uh, that come into uh, our homes or that carry electricity from power generators uh, to the cities. Governments provide some kind of social protection, uh, like the Supplemental uh, Nutrition Assistance Plan, SNAP, or what we used to call food stamps, to help people to eat. Governments provide market regulation, or they're supposed to, <laughs> to stop pollution, to ensure safe products, to regulate financial markets so that we don't have financial meltdowns. Governments provide macroeconomic stability, Keynesian stability, like stimulus spending. Governments underpin the monetary and payment systems. We use something green printed on paper called US uh, dollars, Federal Reserve notes established by the government. Will that remain the same? Will Bitcoin take over? Will some other... Uh, digital payment takeover? That's a question of what is the role of government versus the role of private provision of a payments system. But you can see that governments are very active in the economy and active at many levels. The federal government in Washington, the state government in Albany, the city government uh, in New York City, uh, the global governance through treaties and the UN Charter, regional government, such as the agreements with Canada, Mexico, and the United States or the European Union. So we can think about the kinds of activities of government and the levels of government from global, regional, national, provincial, state, and uh, local government. Ah, so why government? Why do we have government? That's what I have been uh, emphasizing all along, because we need to understand what should government do? Promote happiness, prevent war, <laughs> civil war, uh, support contracts and property, provide collective or public goods, ensure economic needs as in social democracy, provide infrastructure, like roads, redistribute income, uh, as Bentham argued for the greatest good, as Marx argued through revolution, as Rawls argued behind uh, the uh, veil of ignorance, to stabilize the economy. And the idea is that these are activities that markets alone, that private transactions, that voluntary exchange could not secure. 
So governments do things that other mechanisms of social interaction cannot do. Why use the coercive force of government if you think back to Weber, who said that government or the state is the locus of legitimate violence? What's the purpose of coercive force? Uh, we use coercive force, policing, the prison system, the judicial enforcement of uh, contracts to enforce contracts, for example. And why do we want to enforce contracts so that we don't live our lives every day with prisoners' dilemmas saying, should we cooperate, should we not cooperate, but rather we commit to cooperation through a contract. Uh, coercive force of government is necessary to collect taxes. If taxes were voluntary, many people would not pay, perhaps most. <clears throat> so taxes are paid under compulsion. If you don't pay, you go to jail. And why do we insist on collection of taxes? To prevent free rider problems that we studied last week. In the public goods game, if people contribute, they are all better off. But if any individual says, I won't contribute, but the others should, they free ride on the contributions of the others to prevent free riding and the collapse of cooperation, governments use coercive force to collect taxes. Governments use coercive force to punish wrongdoing, to punish cheating, to punish defection, to enforce cooperative behavior. Governments use coercive force to transfer income, say from the rich to the poor. Of course, governments could use coercive force for all the wrong reasons, to enrich the ruler, to uh, oppress uh, the uh, minorities in the society, to punish do-gooding rather than wrongdoing, and so forth. So this view of coercive force on this slide is what, why use coercive force of government if the aim is to promote the common good, to promote eudaimonia, to promote the utilitarian idea of uh, greatest good for the greatest number. Oops. What are the different motivations for the government to actually provide goods and services? And I'm going to have to uh, stop uh, shortly. Uh, there are three different kinds of motivations. One is what are called public goods. Second are what is called natural monopoly. And the third is what is called merit goods. The idea of public goods are the kinds of goods and services that uh, everybody benefits from when they're undertaken and only government will provide them in the right level because private individuals may have no incentive to do so. Natural monopoly is a kind of good or service for which there is naturally not many competitive providers but one monopoly provider. That would be like the road system or the power grid. And merit goods are goods that for some reason we feel that everybody should have in the society because they are rights. They are human rights, part of achieving human dignity and well-being. And so these are different motivations for the public provision of goods. Let's stop at this point. That's a lot of ground. Tony can pick up uh, on uh, part of this uh, on Friday, uh, examining what is the nature of uh, a type of good or a type of service that makes it a public good rather than a private good. Because some kinds of things we naturally leave to the private sector, restaurants, building furniture, making smartphones. We don't say, oh, that's the government's responsibility. But other things we think are government's responsibility, uh, the, the road system, the public health, 
if you leave those to the marketplace, something goes really wrong. And uh, we'll pick up on that point, the structure of public goods uh, on, on Friday. So uh, I'm getting buzzed from all sorts of places. I think I'm probably late to do something somewhere. So I'm going to uh, jump off. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, we zoomed through a lot of material. I didn't quite get to the end, uh, but we'll pick up here on Friday, and I will see you uh, next uh, next Tuesday. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Okay. See you on Friday. Thank you, Professor.